before we start. Good evening, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to the Gig Harbor City Council meeting of Monday, April 10th, 2023. The time is 5.32 p.m. And I will do a roll call from my far left. Council Member Wook? Here. Council Member Storset? Here. Council Member Rodenberg? Here. Council Member Likens? Here. Council Member Henderson? Here. Council Member Martin? Here. And Council Member Barber? Here. All right. If you would all please stand and join us for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Before we begin this council meeting, we would like to recognize that we are gathered on not only the ancestral and traditional lands of the Squabosh Band of the Puyallup Tribe of Indians, but also on the site of one of the largest and longest standing historic villages of their people, the original inhabitants of the Gig Harbor area. I would like to welcome our, oh, that camera, that it's frozen so attractively, isn't it? <laughs> I was like, oh, that's nice, that's nice, okay. Well, <laughs> I don't know how long it's going to stay that way. That's really special. <laughs> I would like to welcome, thank you, Josh. <laughs> I would love to welcome our city staff that are here with us tonight. Thank There are many of you. Thank you all for being here. And our city attorney is joining us online, uh, as well as our finance director, Dave Rodenbach. Thank you for joining us online as well. Um, so... <laughs> I'm sorry, that just completely threw me off. <laughs> Council, are there any changes to the agenda this evening? Okay, seeing none, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? I move to approve the assent second. consent second. agenda. There were like three seconds. I don't know who got there first. Council member Rodenberg, maybe? Okay, we're gonna call it Martin and Rodenberg. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstain? Okay, motion passes 7 0. Thank you so much, Council. We have a couple presentations this evening. Um, I just read a proclamation out in the lobby. We had a reception at five o'clock for all of our wonderful city volunteers and was glad to see that so many people were here. Um, I read the proclamation out in the lobby. And uh, we took a picture. I hope that everybody was able to be a part of that. But if not, um, I'd be, the, the proclamation is in the agenda packet tonight and you're welcome to read that. I have a, <clears throat> another, parks or another proclamation for Parks Appreciation Day. And this I will read and then I will present to Louise Tiemann, one of our Parks Commissioners who is here this evening. Whereas parks, playgrounds, nature trails, open spaces, community and cultural centers, and historic sites make our communities attractive and desirable places to live, work, play, and visit. And whereas parks are places where people can reflect, re-energize, or socialize, where everyone is welcome and which build community and contribute to economic vitality. And whereas parks, greenways, and open spaces provide respite while protecting and preserving our natural environment, and whereas Gig Harbor Park stewardship organ organizations have joined together to create an event that encourages citizens to celebrate the value and enhanced quality of life that parks bring to our communities. And whereas people of all ages have pledged to volunteer their time to clean up and beautify parks and open space throughout Gig Harbor on Saturday, April 22nd, 2023. Now, therefore, be it resolved that I, Tracy Markley, Mayor of the City of Gig Harbor, do hereby designate April 22nd, 2023 as Parks Appreciation Day in the City of Gig Harbor and encourage all citizens to celebrate by participating in this event and visiting their local and regional parks throughout Pierce County. In witness whereof, I have hereunto set my hand and caused the seal of the City of Gig Harbor to be affixed this 10th day of April, 2023.
I know we kind of ran out of time during the reception, but council, were there any words that you would like to say about either proclamation? I wanted to make sure I gave you a chance if you had some, anything to add. Council Member Likens. Yes, thank you. I just wanted to give my heartfelt thanks to all of the volunteers who serve on our boards and commissions. I was unable to make the reception, but um, it's just so great to live in a city where there are so many people willing to step forward and serve, and your contributions are so appreciated by all of us. So thank you. Thank you very much. All right, we, I am, I'm happy to have uh, Chief Dennis Stone here with us tonight from Gig Harbor Fire, and he would, uh, is here with an update from Gig Harbor Fire. I think, Josh, do I need to remind people to turn the mic on and off? Okay, so the mic, um, or the, right there, you can put that, whatever level you need it to be at, that's comfortable for you, and then you just press that little button, and then the green light will turn on. Great. All right. I see that the chief uh, has put a little <laughs> trophy up here uh, to uh, to remind you all that they did in a shootout beat us, uh, and the, they did. But the most important thing that happened at the beginning was a shootout between he and I. Ah, and do you know who won that? You did. That is right. <laughs> that is right. We have, you like to respond. To <laughs> we had to spot the lead. Uh, yeah, <laughs> and. It ended in a tie and ended up being a shootout. That's kind of like if we have a host competition uh -huh. and police were to tie us, I would be quite embarrassed if, uh, <laughs> <laughs> if a bunch of duck hunting firefighters <laughs> tied police officers in I shooting think competition. I a great time was had by yes, all. Yes, <laughs> yes. Thank you. We did have a great time. Okay. Thank you, Mayor and Council, for for having me today. I really appreciate it. I just want to give you a little update on, on what's happened since the last time we talked. Uh, it's been two years since I was appointed fire chief uh, in March 1st, and uh, I just love it here. Um, my wife and I love this community. We love this department and this city. Um, it's our forever home, and we're, we're really glad to be here. And I just thank you um, for, for leading this great city, and we just love being here. Um, also in your packet, I provided you with an on-scene. That's a, a quarterly report that we send out just to the community. This time we didn't mail it. It's a, it's a little expensive to mail to 55,000 people in the community. So we put it online, handing it out and trying to do it through social media. I also uh, gave you our annual report that we just reported to the commissioners too. And, and if you have any questions about that, we can definitely uh, go over it. I also wanna thank you for just our great relationship. Uh, Katrina and I meet quarterly just to, to talk and make sure that we're on the same page. And, and I really appreciate that relationship with her and with all of you. And of course, with, uh, with Chief Busey too. And we have a great relationship. He came out and, uh, and spoke at our, our lieutenants meeting the other day just to, uh, to allow him to ask questions about, uh, about calls we go on together. So thank you for that. But just a reminder about, uh, about our district and um, can you switch? So uh, just a reminder about our, our service area in our district. We do the entire peninsula. So we're a fire district, kind of like a school district. Um, everything from the county line, including Fox Island and, and Raft Island is our, is our district. It's 54 square miles with about 54,000 people. We have nine fire stations, only five of them are staffed. Uh, um, they're the fire stations in red are our staff stations and in blue are the uh, unstaffed stations. Now we have been staffing station 53 at Fox Island about 30% of the time this year. And, and we're excited uh, about that. And we hope to, uh, to open that station in, in the uh, maybe next year. Kind of depends on the levy that we'll talk about here in a minute. But we have five fire engines that are staffed and three uh, medic units. And we went on about 7,000 calls last year. You know, fire is our middle name, but we do way more than, than just go on fires. Uh, we do paramedic transport. All of our firefighters are EMTs. Uh, we do hazardous materials calls, water rescues, uh, technical rescues, uh, auto accidents, wildland fires. Um, pretty much, unless it's purely a police call, when you call 911, we come. 
Um, it's also important to know as a fire district uh, what we don't do because we're a fire district. We don't have any ordinance authority or really any authority at all. <laughs> you call 911 and you ask us to come. Other than that, um, we don't have any authority to uh, people call us for illegal burns and, and uh, um, code enforcement, and none of that is us. That's the city and the county, and we have a great relationship and, and really appreciate working with you on that. One other thing on the next slide that I wanted to talk about is uh, before I got here and before most of you were here, there was some, uh, some tension about fire uh, inspections, but I think that, that we're, we have really uh, solved all of that. So we do the fire inspections in the city as a contract for you. Um, and, and really we look at it as a relationship with our, our community. Um, the success of our program is about relationships with property owners and, uh, and not on enforcement. We want a fire safe community and I know they do too. An example is five years ago, uh, a significant property owner in our city had 10 commercial properties and wouldn't even allow us on the, on the property. And since then, we've created a relationship and we've inspected all of them with, with zero issues. And, and that's the way we want to do it. We're not going to be badge heavy. As you can see, in 2020, we did uh, 1,100 inspections, 414 for a total of 1518, and we had zero referrals to the city. For the last three years, we haven't had to refer to the city at all to ask for enforcement because we're working uh, through relationships, and, and that's the way we want to do it. Uh, Paul Hayes has done an excellent job as that fire inspector. He just retired last Thursday was his last day, and, and we have a new fire inspector, and he's going to do a great job. We appreciate working with, with Paul and, and the entire team. Next slide, please. We try to do all that uh, with what we call wow customer service. Our goal is when we leave that the only natural human reaction somebody has is wow, each and every day. I give our firefighters one rule, and it goes over all the rules. You know, we have we have uh, policies and procedures and collective labor agreement, and there's a lot, stacks and stacks of rules. But I tell our firefighters, you have one rule that overrides them all. If you think of it and it helps somebody, then do it. Your imagination is the only thing holding you back. And, uh, and, and with that, it gives them the freedom to help people, to treat them like it's their mother, like it's their father, like it's their aunt, uh, uncle, brother, or sister. And uh, they're just in the community uh, helping others. This is a picture of a mowing a lawn after uh, we went on a, a lady that had, a, had some chest pain. And while the medics were inside, the firefighters went out and finished mowing her lawn uh, because that's what she was doing when she had the chest pain. Uh, you know, just changing tires. We got to bring Santa runs back this year and we were excited about uh, just being part of our community. Um, some wins that we had on the next slide. Uh, we went to three-person engine companies. I don't know if you know that, but about 13, 14 months ago, before that, we only had two people on our fire engines, and the industry's minimum standard is three, and we just went to that a year ago, and we're excited about that. So once we did that, we we called it staffing up, get, making sure all of our engines had safe uh, and effective firefighters on it, and now we're starting to focus on staffing out. That's why we're going to look at Station 53 on Fox Island and then 57 in Crescent Valley as, as we move forward. We created a standard cover and a risk assessment of our community. Uh, we did a capital facility plan, which then uh, spurred the uh, facilities bond uh, of $80 million, and I'll give you an update on that. Last August, we passed our, our EMS levy. We negotiated a collective labor agreement in three days, and uh, um, we, like I said, we're staffing Fox Island. We have a lot of newness in our department. I'm new. All of our assistant chiefs, except one is new. All the battalion chiefs, all the division chiefs. We have a new HR director and a new finance director. So there's a lot of, a lot of newness in the Gig Harbor Fire Department, and it's pretty exciting. On the next page in, uh, in your packet, and I have a handout to it, too, because it's, it's really small to see, and I apologize. That's why I made copies and also put it in your packet but it's where we're at with our bond. Like I said, we passed an $80 million bond to redo our capital facilities and, and that was funded in January. So we spent from August, the time that it passed till January, uh, going through all the processes to be evaluated and to sell our bonds. And we've done that. 
and now we're going through the permitting and the processing. Uh, station 53 and 57, 53 is Fox Island, 57 is, is Crescent Valley. They're exactly the same. They're smaller projects. We're just adding on the outside of the, the bay some decontamination rooms to uh, keep the smoke and the soot and the bloodborne pathogens out of our living quarters. So we're adding that to those two stations. Those are moving along a lot faster. And we'll probably be uh, breaking ground in the fourth quarter of this year on those two projects. We're gonna go out to bid for one, one project for the two stations because they're exactly the same and, and they'll both break ground at the end of this year. We also will be able to uh, break ground uh, on our training facility, hopefully by the end of this year. If you can go to the next slide, I think I have some pictures of it. This is the support building of our training facility. It's got, uh, it's a two-story building. It also will have our training fire engines in there. The first floor will have what's called a, a dirty classroom, a roll-up door with concrete floors so they can go across the street, uh, do the practice burns, come back uh, with folding chairs and not bring soot into the, into the area with roll-up doors, um, talk about it, and then go back in and, and do another one. The second floor will have two classrooms. We'll have shower rooms, locker rooms, and, uh, and some training rooms. So that's our support building uh, across the street. If you go to the, the next slide, this is our burn tower. It's a five-story tower. It's what's called class B. It'll be uh, propane or natural gas. Uh, it'll be propane, and uh, which makes it a lot safer. Uh, than a class A. Class A is wood burning uh, a building. So this is a class B burn tower. We'll have props throughout the, the, the tower. I think uh, every, every uh, floor will have a different prop. We'll have a car fire on the bottom and there's a garage and each floor is built differently to, to reflect our community. So the, we're going through the permitting process with that. Uh, you know, there's no, not a lot of training facilities built in the county, so it's going a little slower. It's as we educate people uh, about what we're doing, I think in our first meeting, they're like, well, that's a large building that needs to be sprinkled. And we're like, well, we probably don't want to sprinkle, uh, you know, so it's an education process. Again, again, it was very easy to step through, but it was like, oh yeah, we don't, we don't want to do that. But so th there's not a lot of training facilities built. And so it's taken us a little longer. Uh, the county's great to work with, but we'll probably break ground the end of this year, the beginning of next year. It'll take 12 to 14 months to, to build. Uh, in your handout, I've showed shown you, uh, you know, this is the plan as of today, and tomorrow it's going to change, you know, especially when it comes to building. But this is our plan. We'll be moving uh, to Station 51. After that, we're going to start the design of 51. 51's on Kimball right around the corner. That's within the city, and we will be having lots of city input with that building. It's going to be kind of our marquee station. It's our larger station. It's within the city, you know, brick building with uh, with arch doorways. Um, we're going to make it a nice, uh, nice building for our community. Uh, it'll be a lot different than the other fire stations because it is in our city. Um, and we'll get your feedback and input throughout the design phase as we go through that. Then we'll be station 59 and 58 in our logistics, and we'll we'll come back as we go through that. But we're we're excited to work with you and and your team as we uh, as we move into uh, designing station 51 to be part of our city. <clears throat> I went way off track, so I got to get get back in my notes here. Um, so that's the that's our bond. Um, before I move on. Uh, uh, maybe just a pause for a second, if it's okay, Mayor. Any questions about our bond before I move on to levy and other things? Okay. Hi. Oh, Councilmember Book. Yes, thank you. Well, I'm uh -huh. excited for the training facility, and uh, so I have a question that maybe comes attaches to the bond because it's from the training facility. Will other cities uh, in this area be able to use the training facilities as well? Absolutely, Mayor and Council Member. Um, yeah, and police will will be uh, sharing our facilities with uh, with our neighboring agencies and, and with uh, with city agencies too. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, great. thank you. I don't see any other lights okay. at this time. Great. Thank you. Um, next is uh, is our daily operations. As I told you, we have uh, we're funded two dollars per a thousand a dollar fifty of that is the general levy it's called sometimes known as the fire levy but it's actually a general operation levy for our our district and then we have 50 cents for the ems levy that 50 cents was in it's in year six this year we passed it last uh, uh last august and so that went into effect in january um this august we'll have on the ballot i'm i'm pretty sure we had one reading last week 
Uh, we'll have the second reading tomorrow at our, our um, commissioner's meeting, and then they'll pass it in two weeks. So we'll probably have uh, the $1.50 levy lift, lift for our general levy uh, coming in August of, the, of this year. That, that runs our operations of our, of our fire department. Um, we have some significant deficits in our, our department, not only with our facilities, but with our engines. Some of our engines are close to 25 years old. Um, it's, uh, we're, we're, in, uh, we're in dire straits, frankly. Uh, most of the industry standard is about 10 years, 12 at the most, and some of our engines are 25 years and 20 years of some of our, our newest engines. The difficulty is they're a million dollars each, and we're up to some, time, some uh, manufacturers are five years out right now. So uh, we're, we're, uh, we're in a little bit of a pickle right now. Um, our, our air packs are also at the end of the life. And we have to order them. Uh, they're 2.2 million. So you can see with 2.2 on a 37 million dollar budget, 2.2 million for air packs. Uh, about 84 percent of our budget is personnel, and we need to at least order five fire engines. Uh, so uh, uh, that's where the most of the levy lid lift will be going as to our equipment uh, this year. Uh, you know our. Uh, and also planning for the future. I don't want to leave the next fire chief in this, so we're going to start a capital, a sinking fund for our capital in the future so that we don't have this problem in the future. Um, yeah, 23 years is engine, engine 58 and 52. 24 years is to engine 59 and 51, and all of our backup engines are 25 years, and that's way out of life, uh, and we need to take that uh, seriously this year. Uh, so... That levy will have the for and against committee tomorrow. We'll be looking for for and against committee at the commissioner's meeting starting that process. We'll have the levy voted on in, in, in two weeks by the board. And uh, I'm pretty sure that that's, that's where we're headed to have it on an August ballot this year for our levy lid lift. That's all I have. I just, uh, uh, I wanna thank you for your support and uh, thank you for our great partnership. Thank you so much for being yeah. here. Um, Councilmember Martin has a question for you. Yeah. yeah. Great presentation. Thank, Thank you. you so much. What is your thought about urban fires? You know, just last year we had one um, in Pierce County that was fairly large, took quite a few homes, or maybe it was even the year before that. And they're predicting a drought, believe it or not. You wouldn't know that looking out the window today. But just curious, yeah. what? how do you... How, what's your thoughts on that? How do you tackle that? And then the second question I have for you is, I imagine that your medic team is really busy with, unfortunately, substance use disorders, automobile accidents, things like that. And, you know, how can we explain what it is you do so we can help you get more support on these levies? Yeah, yeah, Thanks. Mayor. Council member, thank you. Uh, well, the wildland urban interface is, is definitely an issue. And I come from a, a department, I, I don't know if you know, but I worked in Boise Fire Department for 30 years. And uh, we, we led uh, in wildland urban interface because uh, our city had grown into the, the wildland area. And we had quite a large uh, team. Um, we're a lot smaller here. And uh, there's only 22 firefighters on duty at a time, right? and we only have five fire engines. If we have a crowning fire through our district, to be frank, we're not gonna stop it. Uh, we're, if we can't get it and attack it right away, then um, if it gets crowning through, through our community, it's gonna, it's gonna run. And um, so what we need to focus on is that prevention. We need to focus on um, making sure that we understand two ways in and out, which is very difficult in our community, depending on where you live. And, and it's the thing that scares me the most. I, I will say on a positive note, not to, to completely scare you, but uh, uh, our firefighters are all red carded. We kind of lead the, the um, in, in the Pierce County, uh, we have firefighters that deploy around the nation and we kind of lead that in this Pierce County. I was very uh, impressed when I got here about uh, how well and how many of our firefighters uh, deploy nationally. So we do have the expertise but with only 22 firefighters and five fire engines, um, a crowning fire is going to be difficult to stop. Uh, um, and and we've been we've been pretty lucky because we do live in a in a in a wetter area. But as you know, that that's changing quickly. So I don't know if I put you at ease. Other than uh, number one, yes, uh, we focus with our with 
with our emergency manager on, on signing up for EverBridge to make sure that you get notified when things are happening uh, and, and you'll get a notice uh, on your cell phone that we need to evacuate and, and, and preparing, being ready to evacuate. It's the ready, set, go making sure you have everything ready. You've got your car packed, you got it pointed out, you know, and set, it's, it's time to get, and then go and, and don't wait too soon or too long because uh, then that's when roads get clogged up. So uh, it, it's an issue and it's, it, it scares me, but we're doing everything we can. Uh, the second issue on, on paramedicine. Yeah, we do the, the transport. So we have three transport units here and, and uh, all of our firefighters are EMTs and, and, and paramedics and we transport to the hospitals. And uh, it's a big part of our, our business, obviously. Um, uh, I think I think our community knows pretty well that that's what we do. You know, in some communities they're just fire, and some some are different agencies. And here we're combined, which I think is the best. We have dual role cross trained EMT firefighters, so that they fight fire when when we need it, and then we go on medicals. Uh, and I think that's the best way to use our resources. They're dual role cross trained. And um, so, was your question more about just uh, community awareness on on paramedicine? It, it's really driven towards just probably the increase in calls mm -hmm. that you're having and yeah. the impact that that has on service yeah. in general to the community. Yeah, thank you for that. And and we have, you know, just like police, we're, we're both, uh, our call volumes are going up quick. We had a dip during COVID, which was a, a little strange, but they're already on pace to to exceed before. I think we're about 10% uh, before, before COVID already. Um, and, and that's part of the the levy. If we're going to grow, if we're going to meet the the demand of our community, then uh, then we'll need the levy to pass so that we can do that. If not, uh, you know, I hate to, I don't want to be a Debbie Downer, but uh, we will have to reduce staffing for sure if it doesn't. Thank you, um, Councilmember Henderson. Councilmember Wook was ahead of me. Oh, okay, Councilmember Wook. Oh, well, thank you, uh, and thank you for the presentation. Thank you so much for taking care of our community. Um, I, and I, I want to thank you for the social media that you do, because I'm looking right here at what you put out recently, and these are the March numbers of 568 emergency calls. I think it's important that our community know that this, and it helps knowing, it helps them knowing what you do on a daily basis. So I think that's really important that our community can appreciate you more for everything you do. Yeah. So thanks for getting that out to us. My question, I guess, also has to do with um, staffing. Since we have new people and since people are leaving, is it difficult to find new staffing? Uh, Mayor and Council, it's, it's uh, in our industry for the first time ever, it is getting more difficult. Uh, we've never, ever had a problem. Uh, we usually have hundreds and hundreds of people uh, lined out the door. And then with the people that don't make it, they become police officers. But <laughs> <laughs> that was, yeah, my words. Uh, was, was that my outside voice? <laughs> no, uh, it, you know, we are paramedicine is it's difficult. And we're starting, we are struggling a little bit getting enough paramedics. We're sending three of our firefighter EMTs to paramedic school this year, but it takes about a year to do that. We got a grant uh, uh, with Wes Pierce to, to do that this year. So uh, it's not, um, it, uh, yes, it's getting more difficult, but it's not uh, a big problem that we have yet. Well, that's good to know. Yeah. Thank you so yeah. much. Thank you. Councilmember Henderson. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you, Chief Dillon. It was an excellent presentation. Just a quick note, less of a question, but I know many of your firefighters have volunteered for a lot of these wildfires that have been going on, which gives them some pretty awesome experience to be hopefully not used here, but mm -hmm. certainly wherever they're um, deployed. So keep up the good work. Yeah, Appreciate everything yeah. that you do. Yeah, the, um, we usually get, uh, there's different types of calls. Uh, I won't worry on the type, but from the federal government and different states, and they usually ask, we work with the county to put together a strike team together with other departments, and then we usually deploy around around the nation. And we almost always have firefighters probably starting in the next month or so, all the way through October, November, deployed throughout the year. Mm -hmm. Oh, Councilmember Likens. Yes, thank you. Thank you for the excellent presentation. Thanks. It's so good to hear from you, and I appreciate all that you do for our community. So if the with this levy that's coming up, or levy lid lift in August, 
I know I've been in other communities and just being a healthcare provider, one of the things they focus on if it passes or doesn't pass is response time yeah. and potential effect on response time. Can you talk to me a little bit about what our response times are mm -hmm. and you know how that's improved or where we're at? Yes, even in your handout, uh, in your packet, I gave you a uh, uh, our annual report for our response times. And we break our response times into three different districts. We, um, we're not a municipal Tacoma, Boise, or Seattle. We're, we're, we're different. We're made up different. So uh, it doesn't fit in, the, in always the national standards. So what, the way we break it out, we call it municipal, rural, and remote. And a municipal is anything around uh, a staffed fire station. And we call that our municipal. And we put uh, an organizational goal of being there nine minutes and 90% of the time. And that's the entire uh, response spectrum. That's that's the call processing, turnout, and travel time. Uh, nine minutes, 90% of the time is our goal. We don't go by average time because that means you miss it 50% of the time. And we So we pick 90%. And our goal, our organizational goal is nine minutes in the municipal area. And we we're doing that 88% of the time at nine minutes and 37 seconds. We call the rest of the, um, the district remote or rural. Uh, and then the two islands, we call them uh, remote because they are so far away and more, more difficult to get to. So our, our rural standard is 12% or 12 minutes. And we're making that 95% of the time at 1148. And then the remote area, we, we have a goal of 16 minutes and we're, we're uh, making that 100% of the time. Now that, that 16 minutes is too long, um, you know, but you can only do what you can with the resources you have. But that's why we are focusing on Fox Island because the time it takes to get there. And that's also for our firefighter safety, especially at station 59 uh, out near Artendale. When they're headed that way to a structure fire, they're all alone by themselves. And we need to have somebody there, even if they're coming across the bridge to help uh, on the southern, uh, southwestern portion of our peninsula. So that's our response time goals. And, and then we also have the same thing for EMS uh, that's written in there. So um, as you were alluding to, if uh, the levy, I'm trying to uh, to go at the positive that it will pass rather than the negative that it won't. Um, if it weren't to pass in August, we would be running it in November because we would have to cut services. So uh, my my goal is to talk about the positive. If you vote for this, this is where we're headed and what we're going to do. If it were not to pass in August, we will be frank about what we will have to cut and the times that will go down and the stations will have to close if if it doesn't pass in August. Um, I'm confident in our community. We've uh, passed the last two at 67% and we need 50% plus one. Um, but, uh, but I also don't want to take it for granted. I'm going to be at every Kiwanis and, uh, and chamber and uh, event and every neighborhood association between now and then. But it would cut down on the time uh, to get our, our and, and I haven't made the decision of what we would cut yet, which station we would have to cut or, or close. Um, usually, uh, it's it's the one, um, it, it goes counterintuitive. A lot of times people think, well, you close the one on the outskirts that's the slower station, but you actually don't. You close the one downtown. It would probably be 51 because the other stations can come in. And uh, if you close a station like 59, then it takes a long, long time. Does that kind of make sense? So you usually, it's kind of a hub and a spoke. Uh, you usually close the hub one because the other ones can come in and fill and you, it only adds a couple minutes. Whereas if you uh, close an outskirt station, now you're looking at 14, 16, 18 minutes. Does that kind of make sense? So, uh, but we're going to focus on the positive that it's going to pass and we're going to staff Box Island and buy new fire engines. <laughs> Thanks so much for Thank being you. here and for Thank all that you do. As council has said, we really appreciate you. We're happy for our partnership and thank you that, uh, that you meet with Katrina quarterly. That's really important yeah. um, to keep up that communication open. So yep. thank, thank you, you. Thanks so for much. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Uh, moving on to the mayor's report, um, I was pleased to host a senior and disabled veteran senior property tax exemption seminar here in council chambers last Wednesday. We had excellent food provided by barbecue to you. Thank you. 
Mr. Parker in the back there. Um, it was wonderful there. I really huge thank you to the assessor treasurer, Mike Lonergan for coming out and giving such great information um, and to his wonderful staff who helped people fill out applications, got them the information that they needed um, if they qualified for that uh, property tax exemption. Um, also wanted to thank the three other representatives from Pierce County that provide other services uh, to seniors and uh, disabled um, veterans and uh, County Council Member Robin Denson for partnering with me to make this seminar happen and uh, shape um, for making the seminar happen. So just grateful for all of the people in the community that are um, trying to make people's lives easier. Um, the Emergency Preparedness Fair, which is hosted by the Peninsula Emergency Preparedness Coalition or PEPC, um, is going to be held at Gig Harbor High School on Saturday, April 22nd from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. And this event will feature speakers, displays, demonstrations to help raise awareness for how you can prepare you and your family for in the event of a major natural disaster. So I will be there um, at some point during the day, and I hope that you all will come out and learn how to uh, get your family ready for any kind of emergency. And then also on April 22nd is Parks Appreciation Day, which we read, I read the proclamation about. Um, there are four, four park sites to choose from this year. Um, we're partnering with Penn Met to, uh, on this Parks Appreciation Day, uh, Wilkinson Farm Park, Soundview Forest Park, Grandview Forest Park, and Penn Met Park's Tubby's Trail. So we have a Facebook post about this. We, it's on our website. Um, so come on out. It's always so much fun. I'll go visit every park and say hi to everybody. And it's just, it's really fun. So come on out and join us. That concludes my report, and I will turn it over to our city administrator, uh, Katrina Knudsen, for her report. Thank you, Mary. Good evening, Council. Um, three quick updates for you tonight. We were visited by Pierce County Pierce Trips today. As you may or may not know, the city, I believe for the first time ever, was awarded the bronze, uh, bronze, it's not a statue, but it's a piece of artwork um, for being a best commuter business. And so what that means is that the city has taken steps to reduce uh, trips, commute trips into the city hall. So people are teleworking, they're carpooling. We even have some folks utilizing the Cushman Trail to bike or scooter to work, which is great. And so this is a, uh, a something that I think we should all feel very proud of. And that is definitely um, bolstering our um, our staff as well. Special shout out to Shannon and Diane in our HR department for putting all of this together. And you can see um, them graciously accepting the award today, along with Mayor Markley and myself. So again, kudos to Shannon and Diane for that. We will be uh, figuring out how we can get silver or gold for next year. And I'm sure with Shannon and Diane at the helm, we will make it there. <laughs> yes, we will. <laughs> um, second <laughs> is that the Dragon Boat races are on the 30th of this month. We have a fantastic city team. I believe we have all departments represented with um, even some police officers this year, maybe for some extra oomph. And <laughs> <laughs> we're hoping to go up in the rankings this year. Uh, but if you are not able to be on the boat, I welcome you to join us down there during the day to cheer on the city team. We'll have a, a tent and some refreshments and you can cheer on from the, cheer them on from the, uh, from Scansy Park with me and have a lot of fun that day as well, supporting that event. And lastly, there will be a crime for prevention summit on May 16th here at city hall at 8 30. The chief has collaborated with the Chamber of Commerce and the Downtown Waterfront Alliance, and this is in um, in regard to the increase in crime in our community. Not only are we advocating for uh, pursuits and other legislative fixes at in Olympia, but the chief and his department are working proactively with our local businesses in order to help prevent crime. And so this will be a good opportunity for businesses to hear what they can do in order to be maybe a less attractive target. And uh, obviously our police department is uh, fun to hang out with. So we'll post this on our Facebook page as well as been on the, um, the police department's page. And I think it'll be a really good event, perhaps a recurring event where we can get out in the community and pass on some of those uh, tips and tricks to keep everybody safe. 
Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Yes, I'm excited about all of these different seminars that we're starting to do here at City Hall. Expect a lot more of those um, across multiple subjects for multiple people in the community. So happy to be using our chambers again for informational seminars that are really helping people a lot. So thank you, Chief, for being willing to do that for this business, um, business and crime prevention summit. Um, I will open up public comment on non-agenda items. If there's anyone in the audience tonight that wishes to speak, you can come forward and uh, press the button that says push on the mic stand. And then if you can turn it off um, when you're done speaking, I forgot to ask that before. We're trying, it, the mic, this, this mic, I should have explained before, it picks up almost every sound in the room and it makes it hard for our online audience to hear, so. That's, yeah. <laughs> so that's why we're asking people to turn it off, turn it up. We'll come up with a better system, but this for now. <laughs> um, and if you would please state your name and you'll have three minutes to speak. I'm Karen Busich McDonald. My family's home is on Ross Avenue. I'd like to talk about the short-term vacation rentals and start by saying thank you for your transparency on the Gigabyte newsletter so that we can see how robust the response is. I'm a little alarmed that it's so popular because we're seeing, you know, signs all over the place in our neighborhood. I grew up in the Millville area and was related to half the people down there. Um, what I gleaned from the early numbers is that there's a tsunami of people applying for these permits. What I also see in these numbers, and I hope you see too, is that STRs are going to have a large impact on the availability of long-term rental housing in Gig Harbor. Many of these homes that are applying for STR status could have been permanent housing for people wanting to settle here, but could not afford to buy a home. Another thing that I wanna say out loud is that in the days of social media and Facebook, you see a great many things that go on behind the scenes to get these changes passed into ordinances, like business groups that join forces and raise money to afford lawyers to bring suits against our city and get the outcome that they want. We see this. We see who leads these groups. We see the power of realtors banding together and high-fiving at the end of the day when they change our town to favor themselves. What might have thwarted this lawsuit threat would have been to bring this vote to the people. I don't think the decision should have been made by the seven of you. When the ordinance passed, it was the realtors, mortgage lenders, and wealth managers that were high-fiving the organizers of the super business group on their successes on Facebook. I saw those on Facebook. That makes me sad and that any one of you would have been called a liar as I saw and as I was a victim of some of these attacks because I live next door to somebody who's a driver of the short-term vacation rental um, effort. It just broke my heart. In our neighborhood, we were characterized as bottom fish. The quiet charm of our friendly community is changing and the goodness we try to foster in this town is being diminished by this divisiveness. This is so disconcerting to me. So this is a formal complaint from me about SDRs and I hope that it goes into the record. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, is there anyone else in the audience that wishes to speak on an item not on the agenda? Okay, is there anyone in our online audience that wishes to speak? You can push star nine um, on your phone or the raise hand button at the bottom of your screen. Okay, seeing none, I will close public comment on, oh, oh, thank you, Karen. That cricket gets me every time. And I'll close the public comment on non-agenda items. And we will go into new business item number one, which is the first reading of ordinance 1511, adopting the 2023 Gig Harbor Stormwater Management and Site Development Manual. Um, no suggested motion as it is a first reading. Uh, report comes to us from our public works director, Jeff Langhill. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, Council. Um, 
as you saw in the agenda bill, the city's stormwater manual permit, NPDS stormwater permit from Department of Ecology, requires the city to adopt a new stormwater manual on occasion. Um, the new stormwater manual that we're adopting here is part of our previous permit. We were supposed to adopt that as of August of last year. Uh, we are now at a point where we have a final permit, uh, or sorry, a final uh, draft of the stormwater manual that uh, we are ready to present. Um, this manual is equivalent to the state's own 2019 stormwater manual. Um, the proposed 2023 City of Gig Harbor stormwater manual is uh, technically equivalent to the state's 2019 manual, and it's also technically equivalent to NPDS phase one communities. Those are communities like Pierce County and City of Tacoma. Um, and it is also, we worked with Pierce County to obtain their version of their stormwater manual and essentially convert that into our own stormwater manual with a couple of minor adjustments that were already previously made in our earlier version of the stormwater manual. Um, I say all this because this stormwater manual that you have before you tonight for first reading is uh, known by all around us, the county, larger cities around us. Uh, it's, it's the same technical requirements that they're required to adopt. It's also very similar to our previous manual. Um, and so it is not something new that uh, people out there that are developing their property should be surprised by. It's something that is uh, already out there in the community. And we are just uh, following through with the next steps that are required by the permit to provide this uh, uh, for our developers to now abide by in our community. Um, staff is prepared to bring this back for a second reading at the April 24th Council meeting. Uh, happy to hear if there are any questions, comments, revisions uh, before we bring it back to you on April 24th. Uh, Councilmember Martin. Thank you, Jeff. So, a whole host of revisions I'm going to ask. For. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I do have a question, though. So, I understand things. There's Ordinance 1511, it says you have three bullet points. The second bullet point talks about that it sets the date where existing projects with land use applications that are deemed complete are best for the 2016 stormwater manual. Makes sense. New ones would be for the 2023. Question for you is if projects are deemed incomplete, will be required to use the 2023 stormwater manual? Is that just for the city or if, for example, I'm a developer or building a home or something like that, and I'm not quite through my process, my question to you is, am I now going to have to adhere to the 2023 stormwater um, requirements? And if so, what does that mean for me? Is there a cost? Is there potential delays? Just trying to understand that. And if I'm, and then I guess to follow up on that, if I'm say 60, 70% in my process of getting this completed, is there some leeway in that. So I might be misinterpreting that. So that's my first question is to make sure I understand that. Second one is if we already have projects underway, but they're not completed, what's the impact to the individuals or entities with this? It's a good question. Um, if you have a project that is already underway and it's not vested and you have to come back to finish your uh, project and move it into the last stage, um, you will have to meet the new stormwater manual. You're, we're not going to allow someone to keep using their initial 2016 manual that they started their project under. The good side on that though, is that there are such few technical changes that there should be no impact. I've had the conversation with our city uh, engineer, who's had conversations with our city attorney. I've also had it with a conversation with our senior engineer who implements a lot of these stormwater requirements. And they have looked at the manual and said, yeah, there's there's nothing other than uh, making sure that the storm report that is prepared for the site, make sure it references the proper manual, um, that all the rest of the requirements that they would likely be uh, implementing are all the same as our 2016 or our current manual. Thank you. To add on to that a little bit, uh, state loss, lets us know which projects are available to be vested 
and which are not. And so any project that has uh, been deemed technically complete that is a vesting application, such as a, a binding site plan, a building permit, um, final plat application, those things would be allowed to continue under the code in effect at the time that it was deemed technically complete. Any other project that does not meet that, as Jeff said, would need to come under current this regulation. Great, thank you. Councilmember Henderson. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Director Langham. Um, question. In the new stormwater manual, are there any improvements in BMPs or is this just paperwork type stuff as opposed to the earlier manual, the 2016 manual that we have? Would you say that there's better BMPs? Best management practice? Yes, I, I would say there's there's better BMPs. Um, th there's just new, more advanced BMPs that are included. Um, but re really, a lot of it is is the same um, from what we had before, but there are some small advancements, uh, not technically in the uh, in the design and layout of facilities, though. Thanks. Great, thank you. Um, I don't see any other lights for clarifying questions from I council. Don't mine's working. Oh, is your not? It's well, we got another. No, oh, it's working now. There it is. But then it goes off again. That's weird. Yeah. Okay. Well, <laughs> Councilmember Barber, <laughs> sorry about that. Wait. <laughs> so I think my question is fairly similar to the others. And what I'm wondering is the people who are not going to be vested, have you already been in contact with them? Are they aware of what the changes might be? And I guess kind of a follow on question to that would be what are the major changes that some that these people would need to know about from the old manual to the new manual? Um, they have been aware that we're adopting a new stormwater manual. We have not personally reached out to them and let them know uh, that we are at this point in adopting the manual. Um, but those changes are, like I said, for the design purposes, they're the same as essentially what our existing manual is. So uh, we don't expect there to be for the design process uh, any concerns. Great. Any, anyone else's lights on that aren't showing up on, on my little thing? Okay. Just wanted to make sure before we move on. Um, okay. So I will open public comment on this agenda item. If you're in the audience and you'd like to speak on this, you can come forward at this time. Okay. Um, on In our online audience, you can press star nine on your phone or raise hand, but hand button at the bottom of your screen. Okay. Seeing none, I will open it up for any additional questions council has, and then we will bring it back at the next council meeting. Okay, I don't see any. Thank you um, very much, Director Langham, for your hard work on this and presentation. Thanks to the rest of our staff that are working on this as well. It's no small task to update a stormwater <laughs> manual, so really appreciate your work. Um, so we'll go right into new business item two, which is also, um, Director, Director Langhelm, um, can't talk anymore tonight, apparently. Um, uh, this is the professional services contract for the North Creek Culvert Replacement Design and Permitting. And this um, report, as I said, comes from Director Langhelm. Thank you, Mayor. The proposed professional services contract you have before you tonight, Council, uh, allows for the full design and permitting of the North Creek Culvert Replacement Project along Harborview Drive just north of Donkey Creek Park. Uh, the design that the scope that's included in the contract follows is what was presented at our November 2022 study session where um, City Council directed staff to proceed with alternative one, which is a bridge replacement. Um, this is the same design that we used to apply for a $4 million federal grant application. No word yet on that on this project, but uh, looking for $4 million for construction. Um, the contract though for design um, is in depth, it's long. Uh, it does anticipate that we'll be ready for construction sometime in 2025, uh, but there's a lot of work to do. There's a lot of permitting to do. Uh, we have worked with this proposed consultant parametrics on previous projects with the same consultant who performed the uh, Donkey Creek daylighting, the, the culvert replacement immediately downstream under North Harbor View. Uh, that allowed us to gain some efficiencies 
uh, when working with them on this scope and budget to be able to show where we can uh, have some improvements uh, or these improvements designed and permitted based on their uh, already used knowledge in this area and for this type of bridge structure. So we are supportive of this contract and uh, happy to answer any questions if you have any. Great, thank you so much. Um, Council Member Book. Thank you, this is an exciting project, I think. And when it's finished, our citizens will be very happy, I think, with, with a look and the access. My question is, uh, this is going to be a, a long involved in a project and probably not gonna make people happy with their cars uh, and the traffic while it's happening. Is there going to be some kind of community outreach to our community to let them know what's going on and what it's going to look like afterwards? Yes, there is. Uh, it's a good question. We have near the end, I forget which task number it is, there is a specific task for public outreach, both during the design process and at the end to uh, let everybody know what is going on. Um, traffic control during construction will be a major uh, discussion with the public, with the business owners, property owners, and uh, we have all sorts of utilities that are in the ground there that we need to accommodate. And so there's going to be a long utility relocation window also. And so uh, working with our partners and uh, utility providers here is also going to be something that we need to work, uh, let the public know what's going on and uh, make sure that they, the public, is not uh, unnecessarily impacted because of the utility relocation work. So um, I hope that uh, that portion of the contract will allow us to be able to get the word out and take feedback and modify if we need to some of the design uh, criteria so that we can have the least impact we can during this large project. Right, thank you so much. Thank you, Council Member Henderson. Thank you, Mayor. And Director Langham, um, I noticed in the scope that uh, they were proposing on keeping one of the lanes open during the entire construction. Is that probably gonna slow the project up though? Is it, I'm sure it, they're gonna, has anybody looked at just closing it down for a shorter amount of time and getting it done? We will look at that option because, but we have to figure out how to get traffic through there for that that amount of time. Um, because I, as we, most of us probably remember when we closed, when we made Harborview Drive between uh, Stinson Avenue and uh, essentially Austin, Park uh, a one way for a total two months, I think total. Uh, there was a lot of outcry. Um, this project would have to close the both directions for many months, maybe approaching a year. So um, we're, we're going to consider that. Uh, that's that if we do need if, what the benefit would be, and that will be part of the discussion with council. We're going to come back and have these discussions with council and. Uh, also have discussion with the public to see what their opinions might be. Cool, thank you very much. Great, thank you so much. I'm excited that we're involving the public a lot more in these types of conversations so that they're well prepared in advance. So appreciate that. Um, I will open up public comment on this agenda item. If you're in the audience and you wish to speak, you can come forward. Okay, uh, online audience, you can push star nine on your phone or the raise hand button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. All right, seeing none, I'll close public comment on this agenda item. And I see Councilmember Wilkes slide is on. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I move to approve and authorize the mayor to execute professional services contract with Parametrix Incorporated for design and permitting services for the city's North Creek culvert replacement project in an amount not to exceed $1,300,000. I'll second, second that. Yep. Oh, okay, I think that was council member Henderson. Um, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstain? Okay, motion passes 7-0. Thank you, council, exciting. Um, I will now open it up for council reports and comments. Council member Barber. Yes, thank you. Um, tonight I wanted to talk a little bit about what we can do to support our local businesses, both as council and city and also just in generally in the community. Recently it was reported that the pet store downtown is probably going out of business 
and they aren't alone as many of our local businesses are struggling. And so the first thing I wanted to do was urge everyone to shop locally um, when they can. All these stores need our support in order to thrive. Um, recently, I participated in the downtown parking study that was organized, that's organized twice yearly by volunteers. It's a really fun project. And this year, the results showed that we really don't have a parking problem. In fact, there are fewer cars downtown. But what we have is more of a foot traffic problem. We have an issue where we don't have as many people downtown. We do have employees sometimes who are parking in front of the business where they work. Um, so I'd like to ask that the city continue to work closely with the Chamber of Commerce and business organizations like the Downtown Waterfront Alliance so that we can be as business friendly as possible. Um, I also ask that we look at our policies for parking, permitting, and zoning to make sure we're welcoming businesses while we retain the small town feel that we all enjoy in Gig Harbor. Um, I'd like to ask that we, council, staff, and these organizations sit down together so we can create a plan of support. Um, there are likely some changes that we can make pretty immediately, especially as far as parking goes, um, some permitting, and, and then there are others that are going to take some time. And I feel like if we get started, we can affect some change. In talking with business owners, I often hear them express frustrations with our process, city processes, but also that many of them don't have a voice because their residence isn't in the city. And this is just not okay, in, in my opinion. Our business owners are valued, is valued parts of this community. And so I ask that we establish a regular forum where our businesses can talk with city leaders about their concerns and really have a place at the table. Um, so I guess I'm asking several things, um, beginning with that we all try to shop local and shop small. And I'm asking for more um, collaboration and cooperation between businesses and city leaders. I'm asking our staff to look at ways that we can make changes to zoning that will allow our businesses to thrive without changing the character of our city. So we can do it together. Thank you. Council Member Wick. Yes, thank you. Um, a couple of things. On March the 31st, uh, Council Member Rodenberg and myself were um, honored to be the judges at the chili cook-off. And it was a chili chowder cook-off. It was held at the operations plant here in Gig Harbor, and we had a great time. There were 12 amazing chilies. There were two amazing chowders. There were four uh, cornbreads, and it was a, a good eating day for everyone and for all of our employees. The employees came, they were happy, and they were smiling, and, and a great time was had by all. So I'm grateful that I was able to be a judge there. It was lots of fun. Um, second thing is last week on April the 6th, Several of us attended a presentation on Maritime Washington Network at the Edin Boathouse. And it was really a good presentation. It's something that Representative Kilmer, I believe has been working on since about 2018. And it is now, uh, it is now working well. And it's working so well that the group is working on a grant application for our nonprofits and our businesses and individuals. This application should be ready um, probably in the fall, and maybe it could also be a boon to some of our businesses. Um, you, it is not enough money for capital projects, but it is money for marketing and promotion and even operations. So hopefully uh, when this becomes, when the application becomes available, our businesses can all know about this and uh, can apply and we can perhaps do some help for them there. Thank you. Great, thank you. Council Member Martin. I wanted to say thank you once again to the Chief Busey. I had the opportunity to do a ride along with two of our fine officers last Friday night. It was fairly quiet, so maybe I'm a good luck charm. I don't know, I'm gonna ride it better. <laughs> I doubt that. But they were so complimentary of you and your leadership. They were extremely complimentary of the camaraderie, not only amongst themselves in the police department, but also with their partners in the fire department. Um, both of these officers have 
uh, been officers in other jurisdictions, some very large jurisdictions, and so impressed by how people come together to work together, the civility of the staff, wanting to figure out how to get things done. And then there's this acronym, BPS, best possible service. Yeah, and I got to see that at, at hand. And the, the attitude was not, I'm gonna try to stop you. The attitude is, I wanna make sure you're safe. I wanna make sure you get to go home, whomever that person was that they were stopping for a moment, that you get home safely to your family, that it is supportive of the community. How can I help you with whatever the issues might be? I was, I've was i spent a lot of time in law enforcement and I think those were probably two of the finest officers. And again, I can't speak highly enough. They feel very supported in this community, our police do. Um, and that we know not all police officers are, um, but they continued to share with me just how happy they are to work here, that they're looking forward to new and exciting endeavors that I think are underway and, and things that you're looking into. And so anybody that gets a chance to do that right along, I would encourage you to do so. It does open your eyes and understand the good work that they do each and every day to support our community. Thank you. Thank you so much, Council Member Henderson. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I want to kind of echo Mary, uh, Council Member Barber's comments on this issue with uh, closures in downtown and um, what the city might be able to do to work with our local uh, business owners. Um, I'd like to be a little bit more specific though. I was hoping that we could perhaps get a study session uh, relatively soon uh, that we could have presentations by the Gig Harbor Downtown Waterfront Alliance, the Chamber of Commerce, and actually Gary Glenn who, Gary Glenn, who does the uh, parking survey. Um, I think there's a host of things that we might wanna think about, uh, even such things as eliminating the downtown parking mandate, uh, perhaps some um, zoning, uh, excuse me, permitting um, efficiencies to help new businesses start. Uh, my, my concern is that if we are gonna be seeing closures downtown, closures tend to beget more closures. Uh, we've already seen one and it's a little bit um, unsettling. Uh, so whatever we, the city can do, uh, to help a new business start would be greatly appreciated. And of course, the Downtown Waterfront Alliance the, and the Chamber have their work to do to educate their businesses on how to run a business so their business model works and so that they can succeed and make our downtown a vibrant place to live, which is actually one of our um, priorities in the council. So my request is if we could get a study session relatively soon, because my, again, my, I worry about businesses closing and once one closes, um, things tend to start spiraling out of control. So thank you. Thank you. Um, we will talk internally uh, with staff to see when we can schedule that. Um, I'm assuming there's general consensus from council to have that study session. Yes, okay. So we'll work to, I know we're, we've added an extra study session in April already. So I don't know where we're gonna fit it in, it may be May, but um, Katrina, did you have, I see that you may wanna add something. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, the Downtown Waterfront Alliance board meeting last week, we discussed this and the the board voted to put together a, a subcommittee of the Downtown Waterfront Alliance to look at this specifically, parking specifically. And really there's uh, three tiers that they're wanting to look at. First is signage and education. So letting people know where the current public parking spaces are and educating them on where they are. So that could include a partnership with the city and our um, wonderful mapper, Mike Simmons, who has presented to you all before about how we can illuminate or and inform where these public parking spaces are. Um, secondarily would be to look at the businesses um, employees that are parking in front of other businesses downtown. We know that that's a, a major issue that goes on downtown where um, employees are parking where customers could be parking. And so they want to look at ways to incentivize um, that to not happen with the businesses. And so um, and within the subcommittee, they'll look at that. And then the last thing they want to look at is uh, the parking requirements in our code. And obviously we know that that will be a larger discussion that will have, have need to happen with council first and uh, code amendments that would be required. But I, I say that I, I note this subcommittee that has been formed, it will be meeting, I believe the first week of May or second week of May. Um, and so 
I'd like us to see what comes out of that subcommittee. And I know that they're going to seek uh, city folks to sit on that committee. And I've suggested Carl DeSemus, the community development director to sit on that. Um, and there will, be, there will be room for others as well on that committee, but really it is a, a three-pronged approach. And Carrie Ann Eckberg, the new executive director is doing a wonderful job taking meeting and with all parties that are involved in this and take, because it is such a, um, an important issue in the community. And so I would recommend that we see what the recommendations of that committee are. Um, I know that uh, Councilmember Henderson, and it sounds like all of you would like to have a work session on that. So what I think I would recommend is that we can schedule that at the nearest time possible and have uh, the community development staff describe what the parking requirements are in the code currently so that council can have an understanding of that since I don't think that, that has been a topic since most of you have been on council. So uh, providing the education of what that is and then if there's any information that we can um, give back in that as well, um, that would be my recommendation. I'm seeing nodding heads. So I think that's gonna be- Mayor, fine. if I can just add too, um, yeah. Carrie Ann Eckberg is scheduled to come to present to council on May 8th. So we'll oh, have another yes. chance to talk about this and if great. we don't get a study session before then. Great, that's great. Yeah, this is exciting. Thank you, council members, for being more involved and in, in figuring out how we can support our businesses. And I really appreciate your involvement. Um, I don't see any other lights on. Uh, announcement of upcoming meetings is attached to this agenda packet online. Um, so check out what is coming up. And if there's nothing else, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. Second. Second. Okay. <laughs> All those in favor say aye. Aye. Meeting adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night.